We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Welcome back to Security and Compliance Weekly. We've been talking to Errol Weiss, Chief Security Officer of the Health ISAC today. Uh, before we jump back into the discussion, do have a few announcements. If you want to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. There you can subscribe on your favorite podcast chat, ch- catcher or on our YouTube channel, Sign up for our mailing list, join our Discord server, which is always popular during this show, and our newest live streaming platform, I feel twitchy about it, we're on Twitch. Uh, Actually, I'm not on Twitch yet, I'm holding out because I'm a a curmudgeon and uh, an old dog. Anyway, uh, our next live webcast is going to be April 29th at 11 a.m., that's Eastern Time, and we are going to learn about how to prepare for modern ransomware attacks. Sign up by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. Of course, if you've missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, you can find all of them in our portfolio at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, let's get back to the discussion. Uh, Scott, I had cut you off, so I will let you go yeah. first. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so uh, starting section or starting with the section two, listen to me. Starting the the second segment here, uh, I, w- I want to dive into the financial ability for healthcare organizations. In the past, when Redline has done work, uh, and I've done work with outside of Redline, uh, healthcare organizations, it's always been very difficult to get them to understand that you have to put money towards an effort to be able to grab an ROI of protection. How are you working around that? Hmm. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's <laughs> going to be a classic problem. I think it's, I think you're still, you, you know, I think we all still have a ways to go. We've got a number of organizations that are still struggling to identify the, the resources that they need for proper cybersecurity. And I, but, you know, other other than continuing to uh, preach the gospel and talk about, uh, you know, the things that organizations need to do on a minimum and uh, chat about maybe a few of those, it, it's going to be trying to convince those organizations to start investing where they need to, be it, uh, you know, the resources that they need from, uh, from finance, uh, products that they need, uh, technology on site, and then certainly from the staff and, and adequate staffing and and people on board that can that can run those security systems. You know, not a great answer. <laughs> well, you know, our industry is fraught with questions that can't be answered, and uh, it's part of partially what keeps us all employed, I guess. Um, you brought up in the last segment. You know, you mentioned uh, you know the banks that you used to work at, and you know, and to varying degrees. And I don't, you know, remember the names and titles and everything. But you set up basically uh, organizations looking for threats and looking for threat intelligence in, in both of those uh, banks. And and I think that is a lot of about what you were setting up originally with the FS ISAC and so on and so forth. I'm curious, uh, you know. Uh, in the evolution of the product side of our industry, the vendor side of our industry, threat intelligence uh, platforms, threat hunting, that, that's kind of a, a, a thing that's been uh, popular or up and coming in the last couple years. I'm curious your take on uh, stuff that you've been doing and has been dear to your heart for the last 20, 25 years, now becoming more productized, uh, dare I say, commoditized. Uh, you know, good thing, bad thing, wish, wishing it would go away. What's your take, Carol? Huh. Um, I, I think the, uh, the right way to look at it is to, is, to, is to think of it in terms of the maturity of the organization. And so, you know, we've all seen that capability maturity model from ad hoc to repeatable or you know, whatever the last step is, step five. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to look at even the threat intelligence 
organization or threat intelligence function within an organization much along the same lines. So, you know, hopefully, uh, even on the, on the basic side of it, you know, every organization is looking at cybersecurity in those same terms, looking at the maturity for the cybersecurity program and moving toward that nirvana at step five. And I'd like to try to see if organizations can do the same thing in the threat intelligence mindset. So, so that's, that's kind of like what I'm looking at today. And I think, you know, when we look back in the, the beginning days of what we were trying to do, you know, we spent uh, plenty of time looking at uh, scraping IP addresses and uh, evil emails and then realizing, you know, now we've got this fancy term indicators of compromise um, of what those things became. And when, when you look at the, uh, the, the pyramid of pain that you're probably all familiar with as well, right? The, these indicators now are really on the easy side of things. We ought to be able to easily share that information, um, automate it, automate the sharing out of it, automate the ingestion and the distribution of it and get the humans out of the loop. And then, you know, the problem though is on the flip side with that pyramid of pain is that it's easy for the bad guys to change where they're coming from, change the attack sequencing. So that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to filter an IP address and block uh, any bad traffic coming from an IP, well, it's easy for the bad guys to switch the IP that they're coming from. And that's what I mean by that. So I think we still need to do all of that, but realize that, that the value of that intelligence is short-lived. And then try to move toward the, the tougher end of that spectrum there, which is looking for the attack behaviors and trying to understand what are the bad guys trying to do and trying to figure out what that behavior looks like and try to identify that behavior so you can stop it. And I think all part of that comes down to the maturity of the organization, the maturity of the threat intelligence organization being able to do those things. So, Jeff, you mentioned hunting. You know, I think that's an invaluable part of a, of a mature organization. They ought to be able to do those things. They ought to be including those things as part of the spectrum of services that they offer internally, but all part of the maturity curve in the organization. Well, you talk about information sharing and the ease and ability uh, to be able to say, yes, the SolarWinds hack is tied to the exchange hack, which is tied to <laughs> other things that have been done. The government tried to do this, right, with sticks and taxi, but that never really took off. So, so how, would that, how, would, how, would, how would sharing inside of the ISAC be different from using something that the government tried to do, or at least the U.S. government tried to do? Uh, how, yeah, how are you there was, overcoming there was that? A, there was a lot of oh. private sector um, effort behind the creation of that sticks and taxi standard. And MITRE was helping it as well, and they've been pretty involved with it still today. The government adopted it. Others adopted it. And it's a big part of the standard that's out there when it comes to automated info sharing. But, uh, you know, to your point, I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's not the be-all, end-all. And there are, since then, other sharing mechanisms and other sharing standards that have been developed that I think are much more effective. And one of the things that we're trying to do with Health ISAC is trying to encourage organizations to share that information, but also be able to keep the data in the native format so that the tools that, that, um, that those IOCs are destined toward can ingest them in their own native uh, format so that we don't lose any of the fidelity along the way by translating into stick taxi, getting it and retranslating it back to the, into the format that I needed it. So that's kind of like where we're going. But yeah, it's, there's definitely plenty of work that needs to be done there. You know, another sort of random shotgun question, because that's the way my brain works these days. Um, I've had more experience uh, with the retail, now retail and hospitality ISAC. Not sure when exactly they change, uh, but uh, you know because of my work with PCI. It's because you left. Uh, obviously, I've <laughs> been around a lot of retailers. Um, you know, in the early days of PCI, it was very common for me to go into a, a retailer or a merchant to use more of the PCI vernacular, and they would ask questions along the lines of. How secure are we compared to our competitor, to the next guy? Uh, are we doing the right things? And very much their concern was not to be secure, but to be 
as secure as everybody else so they weren't sticking out uh, you know uh, doing anything blatantly uh missing anything blatantly uh, uh, um has has have you seen that in in the the isacs you're involved with is that unique to retail is, is that an old old school way of thinking is, is it gone yeah. away I, I think people love benchmarking for all the reasons that you talked about, but I'll throw one more at you, which is, mm -hmm. I dare say that I think people like to use benchmarking because they want to make sure they're not spending too much on security. Right. I mean, as oh, shocking absolutely. as that might be, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I would say, I would say like every, every place that I've worked for, it's been different uh, industries and whatnot, every place, financial, healthcare, uh, these little cute startups and SF, all of them want to know in their vertical, like how well they're doing uh, security wise from their competitors. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting that they, they want to benchmark like that. Yeah. But it's, it, I don't yeah. think it's just healthcare. I think it's everyone. Yeah, I agree. So let's focus on healthcare a little bit more. I mean, Josh kind of threw down with, you know, healthcare is sort of notorious for having lots of breaches of privacy information. Um, they tend to be, uh, and this, you know, this is perception or not set it straight. They tend to be less funded, therefore less mature. Um, you know, what what would you through the vehicle of this show like to what message would you like to get out to people that are involved with healthcare organizations that uh, should be involved with the ISAC? Uh, you know, give us your pitch, I guess. Yeah, I, I well, I'll even keep it like not even just healthcare specific. I, I think the, uh, the 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 thing about the ISAC and and ISAs, and again, when I say ISAC, I don't mean to exclude the ISAs, so I. No, 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 no. Well it's totally cool. It's totally, I'm, I'm not in the corner. It's all right. Don't worry. There you go. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think the really neat thing about it is I, I just see it not, not only like I, I talked about some of the benefits before about the, you know, the virtual neighborhood watch program, but I think that, that during my involvement through the ISAC, the years I spent in financial services, at, and again, at places like Bank of America and Citibank, I learned so much by participating in the ISAC personally. I was able to um, learn not only about technology issues and attacks that were happening at peer organizations, but also about best practices and, and tips and technology and advice and, and even um, career guidance and counseling from, from, from people that I became friends with through the ISAC. So it's, so it's as much of a, of a, how do I protect my organization as it is uh, uh, about an opportunity to really grow uh, your own skills and your own professional development? And, you know, I just, I'll throw one example out there. Like, again, I just, I, I think it's important because, again, I was working at Citibank at the time, and it's a huge security organization at the time, over a thousand people in security. We've got, we're spending tons of money on security and, um, you know, the, probably the perception was that, you know, security really had their crap together and, and they did. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> my point is that, that, that it was important for the, for I'll say the smaller organizations not to be intimidated by that, to be actively participating, communicating on those same channels and those same areas that, that we were playing in as well, because I had this much to learn. And I'll never forget that I was at, a, a, an ISAC meeting one time, there was a CISO from a small bank in upstate New York talking about uh, a bank, the latest banking Trojan malware that was out there. And I was like, wow, this guy really knows this stuff. How, how is he getting all this information? Right? This is just amazing. And, um, and, and so that to me just, just, again, just solidified the value of the network that's out there and the ability to share across that and to be able to play, you know, and be able to learn and be able to you know, really benefit from all that. So does that imply at, at ISAC meetings that, uh, you know, you know, people check their identity and ego at the door and, and you, you try to promote sort of a, a level playing field? So, he has to think about right, this. This was a pause of the question. <laughs> that's a that's Do people a no. leave their egos at the door. <laughs> you know, like, I don't it's know, it's man. Fine. What do I answer? They're going to yell at me if I tell them the real one. 
One more time. Say it again. Well, uh, you you implied that there's you know you encourage smaller organizations to not give up hope, and right. and I have to tell you, especially the last you know two three months three months whatever it's been since the solar winds and all the you know all the arms that have fallen out of that, I've been involved with a a whole lot of discussions in different venues where people just kind of throw up their their arms and like you know why do we even bother you know we're we're screwed we're lost it's you know it's hopeless we're all doomed. You know, there's there's no way that we can adequate adequately secure and defend, uh, you know, publicly re- regulated water treatment facilities throughout the mm-hmm. country, and, and and you know, might be in your yeah. neck of the woods, Errol. Uh, yep. You know, there's you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, pick an industry vertical outside of financial services, perhaps, and everybody's kind of staring down the you know, sort of the doomsday scenario that you know used to be hypothetical, but you know, seeming more often than not is becoming reality uh that in the context of you're saying let the little guys participate uh but i but i know a lot of the little guys they kind of throw up their hands and like you know <laughs> and it's sort of a joke on this show why should we even bother why not why don't we just get cyber insurance and be done with it uh you know how how, how does how do the because ISACs, that's not the answer cyber insurance not is the not answer. the answer it's not the answer but it's it sure seems that way sometimes. It's a damn yeah, Jeff has a point. A lot of people, Jeff has a point though. Like it might not be the answer. It's not the answer that you want, but people be like, insurance, bucket. It is a way of transfering it. risk. Yeah, it's okay. Exactly. We can swear. It's not no, 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 no. Even your okay. crappy yeah, language is acceptable. Well, so let me ask the question a different way, Errol. I mean, back in the day when we were first getting started, uh, and I mentioned earlier, you know, the bad guys were stealing money, and that's why the financial services organizations are was right. a, a big reason why they're more mature and have the budget because they can afford it for one thing. Uh, but you even implied that you know there's disparity between a city bank and a and a regional uh, you know state state credit union or something like right. that. Um, I've lost the question now, damn it. Little guys, big guys, he goes. <laughs> well, oh no, okay. So back in the day it was bad guys stealing money. Now uh, because of the collective efforts of so many over the years, it's it's become harder. It's not the path of least resistance for the bad guy to simply go steal the money, find the crown jewels, you know, in the PCI world, steal the report, the databases that are unencrypted and have tens and twenty millions worth of credit cards in them. You know, now it's more lucrative, it seems, to do things like ransomware. And the easy targets for the ransomwares are the little guys. That that don't have the budget, don't have the maturity, right. you know, don't have the focus of the vendor. And I can't, you know, I, I don't know how many conversations I've had with vendors where they're like, yeah, we agree with you. Things are bad, but you know, we're not going to target the little guys because there's no money in it for us. Why, why should we? So in a, in an industry that's fraught with the vendors uh, and, and vendors, uh, you know, trying to sell more and, 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 and constantly renew themselves and make their, make their budget. Give us, give us some light. Give us some hope. Not too big a question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, the the biggest challenge I would think in, in all of that is that the uh, the smaller organizations probably don't even know where to start. Right? You have a hundred dollars to spend. Where am I going to spend it? Um, yeah. I, I I think the 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 opportunity for them, and again, maybe even this is one of the other value points with the ISAC is that. Just by networking with your peers and, and having those conversations, when you do get the $100 to spend, you can reach out to someone and say, okay, what do I do with this? What's the best bang for the buck that I get out of this? And, and you know, mm-hmm. there's plenty of advice that comes along with it. So you don't have to hire a consultant potentially to do that. There's you know, 4,000 people on the chat channel here that will be very happy to chime in on what's best. Okay, so I'm glad you said that because... You know, I, I've spent the most of my career, uh, the bulk of my career in the private sector, doing the consulting, and and uh, a lot of that role has been going into companies that are less mature and just explaining the basics to them. Um, so, if you have that hundred dollars to spend, I mean, in many organizations that I've worked for over the years, we've we've been fighting to get the our prospective customers to spend a little bit of that hundred dollars on us, trying to help them make you know sound investments and 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 informed buying decisions because the they want to go out and buy product 
Um, and, and, and you, and you just threw down and, and that fair enough. Uh, why spend money on consultant when you've got a, a free resource here? So, you know, to put it in context, if you have a hundred dollars to spend and you're a relatively immature organization, what in your mind is a good way to spread out? And, you know, I'm not going to hold you to this, but you know, how much do you invest and, um, in, in product blindly because, and here's my, here's my take on, on the consulting thing. If you're not listening to the consultants and you don't have these, these, uh, chat rooms from the ISACs, uh, all that you have left is the sales guy for the vendor, which right. to me is, just, you know, as sincere as they claim to be, there's, there's conflict of interest there. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and you can't just really, yeah. And, 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 you know, maybe being a little facetious there, you can't do away with the consultants because uh, I think, you know, to your point, you're going to need them on implementation and there's, there's the whole product life cycle that you need to, uh, to make sure that you're, uh, setting yourself up for so that you don't, uh, you know, to your point, you, know, you don't just buy the product and then it ultimately just sits on the shelf doing nothing and n- not helping anybody. So, yeah. So uh, out of the hundred dollars, uh, I assume that, uh, you know, uh, beyond qualifying to join an ISAC, I, I assume that there's a cost associated with joining. There is. It's not a f- yep. Okay. So some yeah. part of the $100, rather rather than spending it on product or spending it on consulting, uh, you should spend invest in the ISAC because it's, you know, once you're past the, the membership fee, uh, it, there's a mountain of resources. And I, I think that's fair. Typically, and that, I think that's legitimate. Typically, membership fees scale on the size of the business. That's that's what my that's experience right. has been with the ISAX and ISAW yeah. world. So it's yeah. not like it's designed to be an uh, overwhelming cost. It's designed to be pretty nominal, honestly. We're talking a few thousand dollars for a company making tens of millions of dollars you know, a year. Yeah, we have even had a further um, split that's in if, health ISAC that's between if, That's if the organization is run correctly. One at a time, please. Errol? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I said uh, on our with the health ISAC, we even have it split between profit and not for profit, so it gets even. Oh. I think our smallest well, yeah, tier of healthcare like companies are not for profit. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Scott, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was saying that's if it's run correctly. The ISAC, mm-hmm. ISAC, you mean, or the? Uh, they, no, uh, it, it doesn't or, matter. It, it doesn't matter. It it comes down to how how that business is run, whether it's a nonprofit or a prof, ISAC, ISAC, whatever. All comes down to how it's run. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's um, normally, let's say it's supposed to be a vaguely nominal fee to be a member. There are tiered memberships. You get more depending on which level of member you are, that t- kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot of ISAs and ISACs that, that have, you know, startup or affiliate or student or whatever memberships. So you can actually start making contacts and networking in your, in your preferred vertical, in your preferred world, if you will, before you even get a professional uh, job there, which is really nice. Um, but one of the biggest things with ISAs and ISACs is that it's, it's really tough, you know, uh, and this actually goes back to Scott, what you were talking about. I think did Scott, did you bring up InfraGuard? Was I, was that somebody else? Uh, no, it was brought up earlier in the conversation. I was just elaborating was on it because, <laughs> yeah, that was Kat. Oh, Kat. Um, because InfraGuard, uh, InfraGuard says you need to meet, meet this list of requirements and then you can join versus ISACs, right. ISAs and other professionally non-professional organizations that are set up for information sharing where it's anybody who's doing this job can join and get access to the information. Uh, that's true and not true. There are uh, requirements depending on what level of member you are, depending on what information you have access to, the threat oh, intelligence, yes, yes. that kind of thing. You're right. The size of your wallet does matter. Wait. Other things matter as well. Mm-hmm. What you're doing, who you are, U.S. citizen or not, there's various things that that matter. Irrespectively, I think what I want to talk, Errol, what I want to chat with you about is more the um, the relationship that the ISACs and ISAs have with the U.S. government uh, because they are under, uh, I think, Jim Gilson. Jim, you were the one that brought this up in the uh, uh, in the earlier piece of the conversation about how they st- were started in the 1990s under NPPD, DHS. And uh, I, I really, I, I know we're running close on time. I just want to spend two minutes on this. Errol, what do you think about the relationship and the information sharing between the ISACs, ISAs, and the U.S. government? Is, is it a nice bilateral information share? Always room for improvement, right, is going to be my bottom line answer on that one. And again, I, I think it varies. I mean, 
I saw when I was with financial services, I saw uh, a lot of really good interaction between Treasury and the financial services ISAC. Uh, a lot of work with DHS also while I was there. In fact, uh, we had a number of people that had top secret security clearances that were integrated within the NKIC. They were able to, to sit on the, the floor there uh, and exchange inside that fusion center. It was a pretty neat environment. Uh, where I see today where I am with Health ISAC and uh, still working with DHS and still a lot of um, good uh, interaction happening there. There's some work that's also happening with HHS and, uh, and we can do more there as well. But we do have a good working relationship, I'd say, at the grassroots level. So plenty of room to go. I'd love to see us sharing more in, in the healthcare, especially in uh, classified info sharing sessions. But uh, we got some ways to go there. Okay. So there's improvements to be made, but you're doing really well otherwise. It's going all right. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. Not bad. So if you're yeah, in healthcare not bad. and uh, want to get as part of the healthcare ISAC or want to be part of it or talk to Errol, Errol, how can they contact you? Because I think this is important. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think one of some of the resources that we provided uh, uh, earlier, we've got um, uh, links to the National Council of ISACs, and that will get you the um, the web pages for all of the ISACs that are out there. I also provided a link to the ISAL Standards Organization, which has a uh, links to all of the ISALs that are out there as well. So between those two links, you can find your ISAC, and that is the way to get started. Uh, many of them have uh, about the ISAC and how to join once you get to their main pages. All right. So another question I had uh, for you, Errol, um, you had mentioned early on that, uh, uh, you know, when I guess it was the FS ISAC started, you, you wanted to steer clear of regulators. And I think regulators uh, and compliance people kind of, you know, roughly morph together. Uh, and that's, you know, I've done compliance for a lot of years. Uh, but nowadays, I would call it more consulting advisory, just trying to go in and, and help organizations do better, get better, whether it's to get past a compliance standard or you know, just to do better from a security perspective. Uh, I think they're very closely al aligned within PCI. But uh, that notwithstanding, uh, my question is, uh, you know, what is the state today in terms of the ISACs in involving uh, not just, you know, organizations within the verticals, but organizations who are committed to helping uh, organizations within the vertical, you know, consulting advisory firms uh, still still frozen out? Or is there a way for, for you know, like my day job company? Uh uh, is there is there a way for us to participate in a in a positive way to try to push the ball forward? Yeah, I think uh, you, you know again all the ISACs are different, so uh, you, you know I can only speak to the, the, my experiences between financial services and now health. Um, mm -hmm. There are a number of ways for uh, vendors, consultants, product companies to partner with those ISACs. Uh, to to offer services, sponsor, you know, whatever it is to get in front of those members. But there's a variety of ways mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. I mean, so you, I, I know I've seen you've been doing health for, I guess, almost two years now. You're yeah, about two to years, come up yeah. on an an yeah, coming anniversary. Up. So I see a lot on, on and, and it seems like if there's a difference between security and compliance is you're, you're playing more in the LinkedIn world, whereas our traditional audience is over in the Twitter world. Mental note, um, but I, I see I see you promoting a lot of webinars, and you know, in the in 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 the minute that you were part of health before the world shut down, uh, you know, meetings, uh, seminars, and things like that. So those are ongoing. How, how does somebody that might might have some experience in speaking to uh, audiences and have a message to share get involved? Same same with the links or uh, that you've shared or is there another way to sort of tap into the you know if you want to teach if you want to lecture if you want to participate in the webinars yeah. yeah i think it's the same way there's um uh all of those you know the, those isacs have contact information on there so i would encourage anyone who wants to be able to share like that 
uh, to get in touch with uh, the, the appropriate ISAC and figure out uh, what that relationship could look like. You know, Jeff, this reminds me also of like another interesting story, like back in the early days of the uh, pandemic response. So now coming up, I guess it's been just about a year right now with the, mm -hmm. uh, the creation of like things like the Cyber Threat Intelligence League or the CTI League. You know, we had a lot of security researchers globally that were tired of seeing hospitals being um, hit by ransomware and victimized, especially during the pandemic response days. So they were like, you know, damn it, we're going to just volunteer our time and we're going to put uh, time in to help out hospitals and do what we can do to, do to help them from a cyber standpoint. So, you know, that group has grown to like the last time I looked was over 1400 people and, you know, they're doing some really neat work. So there's a lot of different ways to volunteer and, and help out. Cool. All right. Uh, any other closing out questions? Any of my co-hosts? Great information. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Yeah, I do have one. Us. I've got one. One quick one. Uh, yes, Kat, please. Medi uh, do you guys, uh, uh, in, the, in the healthcare ISAC, do you address, like, um, threats for medical devices and, and all that kind of stuff, too? Is there, like, guidance on that? Oh, man, you should ask me that, like, a half hour ago. So, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, it's great. I could talk forever about it. Now, what, it's one of the neat things I saw, like I mentioned it earlier, where we've got medical device manufacturers that also belong as members. So we have a special mm -hmm. interest group called the Medical Device Information Sharing Council. I think I got that right. Um, and it's made up of health delivery organizations, so hospitals and the medical device manufacturers. And so can you imagine what the dynamic is when you have both of those or types of organizations sitting around a table discussing the latest vulnerability and the manufacturers talking about, you know, you need to upgrade your device because it's vulnerable to this CV, that CV, and all this other stuff. And the hospital saying, well, I can't take it out of service because it's life-saving critical device and it's running 24-7, yeah. right? Mm. So, um, so anyway, it's a great group. They work on problems like that together, and it's really neat to watch that dynamic and, and watch them solve problems. That's cool. Mm. Yeah, I should have asked that 30 minutes ago. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really cool. It's, okay. it's, it's one of the things that makes this place unique. All right. Well, Thanks. Errol, I'll, I'll give you the last word. Any, any parting shots? I mean, you, you mentioned you shared links with us, and they are available in our show notes, so listeners can go find them there. But you know, any parting thoughts, words of wisdom, admonitions to our to our yeah, audience? Yeah, just the, the last thing I'll mention there, Jeff, and, and all of those links there is a uh, toolkit. It's the info sharing best practices toolkit. And say if anyone needs help inside their own organizations trying to figure out how to get started, there's a lot of tips and tricks in there. You know, I, I know people face challenges from your own management, from your own general counsel. Usually those are the big um, problems that I've seen in the past. So there's lots of really neat things that have worked for others to all put together in this document. And it's shared in a Word document so you can make it your own and keep it up to date. So between okay. that and join your ISAC or ISAL, that's that's it for me. Great. And I, I, I lied. I did have one more question, but also I wanted to share in the show notes. I also found links. Uh, Errol, uh, it's been almost 10 years ago, actually uh, gave uh, congressional testimony. So if you want to see Errol all dressed up spiffy in a suit, uh, I found a link to the video and that's in the show notes as well. Um, the last question I, I've been meaning to ask this for like the last 40 minutes and I, I keep forgetting because yeah. the conversation kept going in different directions. When you join in ISAC, how much are you expected to uh, give as opposed to take? What's the expected great, ratio? Great question. So I would say really what we try to tell our members um, when that comes up is there's, there's really no expectation. You don't get kicked out if you don't share is the, is the bottom line. But we do, mm. what we do say that you will get more out of this relationship if you do share. And I think I go back to my earlier point about it even just being a, a great way for me to grow professionally and to learn and, mm -hmm. and to grow um, some of the skills, uh, you can only do that by being active. And so that's that's the push. You get out of it, gotcha. you put into it. Yep. And then some. I mean, All right, yeah. super. Uh, I'm glad I snuck that one in. I'm glad I finally remembered to sneak that one in. Errol, it's been a, a pleasure and a privilege to to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, I nice hope you guys me, all uh, got some benefit learning about ISACs and ISOs. And uh, if you work for an organization that is uh, qualifying, 
Go check out which ISAC you can be a part of. I encourage you to become members if not, if you are not already. Uh, that's going to wrap us for this week, and uh, we'll be back next week. I think we're going to talk about some fun things like uh, security awareness training. I think that's on the slate. So until next week, uh, stay secure, stay compliant, and uh, do it with a smile on your face. We're out. <laughs>